Welcome, Joe Cohen, to the Upgraded Executive Podcast. Thanks for having me here, Nick. It's our pleasure, Joe. <laughs> I've been a long-time fan of uh, particularly self-hacked and self-decode. I use self-hacked a lot, particularly when clients ask me, you know, what about this supplement or this mat drag or this or this nootropic? I think it's a absolute fabulous resource. Thanks. I appreciate it. Yeah, we've uh, we've been working on it a lot. We made a few changes and this is based on the feedback we got. And it's also based on what search engines are looking for now. Basically, in the past, we've had like, here's all the benefits, potential benefits. And then we gave the research for each one. Now what we're doing is we're categorizing them into the likelihood of effectiveness. So this is possibly effective, likely effective insufficient evidence, things like that. So we kind of do more of that work for you. And, mm-hmm. um, and then you could, you could still look it up, even if we have it on, under insufficient evidence, you could look at the, what the evidence actually says. We're also getting it reviewed by a bunch of different medical professionals who have different uh, viewpoints. Mm-hmm. So like PharmDs, MDs, PhDs, we're really um, you know, making sure all the content is acceptable to MDs and scientists and like just from different points of view. If it has to do with a neuroscience post, we Mm. put a neuroscience PhD on it. So Joe, tell me, how did you get started with this? You know, did you have a call to action in your life that made you think, you know, I need to start taking responsibility for my own health? Yeah. So one thing I realized was that if you're not healthy, you really can't do anything else in life. If you think about what the most important things in someone's life is, healthy, happy are, are big ones. And then they, they might want to say they want to have good relationships. They want to do things they want to do, right? They, but it, if you actually break those down, they all require you to be healthy. Great. So if you're going to like get into relationship, it's a strain on your relationship if you're not healthy. If you're going to try to make money to do things that you want to do, you're not going to be able to do that if you're not healthy or it's going to be a lot harder. In my case, it was just not possible because of the types of issues I had. They were affecting motivation more than anything else. It was affecting core cognitive functions and things like that. And so for me, it wasn't an option. It wasn't like I even had a choice. But for, but for people where it is an option, maybe they don't really notice that big of a difference. But if you are having health issues, no matter pretty much what it is, it will affect your relationship in some way. Uh, it'll affect, you know, if you can go out or do what you want to do, it'll affect how much money you can make. So preventative action is really important because an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, right? It, it really, like, if I were to wait, if let's say I didn't do anything and I would have waited, I probably would have gotten a whole host of, like, general, you know, recognized diseases rather than just symptoms of an undiagnosable disease. I realized that in order for me to do what I wanted to do in life, get in a relationship, you know, um, make some money, like, be financially uh, autonomous and you know, just I, I didn't need to be like super rich or anything, but just have a have a good and reliable living. Everything really came back to uh, you. You really need to have your health in order, and th- and that's something I realized. So before I did anything else in life, I I, I just said, okay, I got to fix these issues. Number one priority, you know, I was twenty six. I got to shel- shelve everything aside to focus on my health. Mm-hmm. Joe, are you, are you happy to share with the audience the kind of things you were suffering from? Yeah, so I'm pretty public about that. Uh, I suffered from really, I had a lot of symptoms. It was brain fog, uh, joint pain. I had, you know, it was just anywhere I got an injury, I, I had a lot of pain. I had IBS. I had uh, other gut symptoms. I had like sleep problems. I was tired. I had motivation issues. I had uh, anxiety and other mood issues. Uh, So there was a whole host of problems. I had other kinds of inflammatory issues. So how did you even get to the point, Joel, where you felt, you know, enough's enough. I have to do something about this. Happens to be for me, I tried a very high fat diet. Like I was Mm. putting on, I was pouring on coconut oil 
And I, I also started to get like new problems. And it was the combination of those things, like uh, an experiment gone wrong. Like mm. it, even if it wasn't a good diet for me, my body should not have like basically melted down. I, I was anywhere I went, I started to get environmental sensitivities. I would just mm. be sensitive to everything from the environment. I just realized that my body is so delicate in that state that something has to change. And, and I'll give you another example. Anytime I would play sports for like an hour, I would get the worst headaches and I would just feel winded and nauseous. And it was just like, I realized, okay, I was basically getting new symptoms. My existing symptoms were getting worse. And I realized that the direction that I'm going is not good. Mm -hmm. Right. I, I, even, I mean, even if it were to freeze, it wouldn't be good. It would be pretty mm -hmm. bad. But the fact that I was going in the wrong direction was a problem. Yeah. So how did you even get started, Joe? So I presume you had these conditions. You you probably went to your MD and no doubt got, you know, not a lot of answers. And then you've taken responsibility yourself. Where did you even start? I went to a couple doctors, uh, mainstream doctors, and it quickly dawned on me that they're, they don't really understand <clears throat> the body in the way that I needed, like... They don't really, they can't really solve complex conditions, right? Mm. It was clear that they, they, they more operate via a checklist approach, right? Do you, you have this issue? Okay, let me, if they're a primary physician, they send you to a specialist, right? Because they, they, they really can't take care of it. But it's really, they're operating like a checklist. And, you know, for a lot of things, for most things, I think like the checklist doesn't work, right? Because mm. everyone's condition is somewhat unique. Everyone's symptoms are unique. and people respond to different things. And if you're just going with a checklist, um, I think that's, that's something that, you know, it, it has some value in, you know, especially uh, pre-genomics era. era. Uh, but once we have all this data with lab tests and genomics, I think it's a very outdated approach because now you can actually have more personalized approaches to your health uh, than just a standard, like, okay, you've got this condition, do this. Did you start with your genomics and also your some kind of blood work as a, as a starting point? Yeah, so I've been getting my blood work since I was around 20. I realized the importance, even though I didn't, you know, I knew a lot less than I do now, I, I just realized that I need to be able to track my lab tests and mm. see what's going on. Right, and I, 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 I kind of had this intuition that my doctors are not telling me everything I need to know. Right, when, mm -hmm. when you go to the doctor and they say your lab tests are fine, and then you like you look look at your lab tests, you Google some things, and or you know, and then you're just like, wait a second, this doesn't seem necessarily optimal, right? But you don't really know that much, and but I, I just knew I wanted to save my lab results, so that I kind of knew already. And then the genetic stuff didn't get popular really until 2013. As I was developing self-decode, I was, you know, finding things out as well. So it was with the genetic stuff, it's kind of like a process. It wasn't something like, oh, I looked at my genes and then I found out everything in the world, right? It's kind of like you find a clue here, you find a clue there. Mm -hmm. Over time, you could really find out more and more things. I, I find out things all the time. I'll give you an example. So in 2014, 2015, I discovered a gene that was involved with my food sensitivities that was related to the cannabinoid receptor. And that allowed me to do experiments that took that into account. Because I realized that, you know, the gene was, was uh, you know, wasn't a very common gene and it was also associated with a lot of conditions that I had. And then I also realized that the, the cannabinoid system in general was related to a lot of the symptoms that I have, right? The cannabinoid mm. system is a very anti-inflammatory system, it's very concentrated in the brain, and that's why it has an effect on inflammation and mood. And so a lot of the things I realized that were affected by the cannabinoid system, and I also had this genetic variant. And so those are, that's the type of situation where things came together, and it's like, okay. And then I, I had a lot of clients that I looked at their genes, and I started seeing that the people who I suspected had these kinds of uh, food sensitivities, as, as I did, they were more likely to have this variant. So that was like 
one of the first things, that was one of the most impactful things that I noticed. Just to give you an example of something that I learned recently, I was getting symptoms whenever I ate fish. So I was Mm. eating fish for two weeks one time, and I noticed that I was getting like memory problems, a whole bunch of cognitive issues. It was, it was really bad. And, then, and, and, and the truth is, is that I never really noted that, noticed it too much before. It was just that when I ate it in a concentrated period, mm. it was just like I got on a binge where I was eating like a lot of sushi, a lot of fish. I started to notice cognitive problems and it, it was different kinds of cognitive problems. It was like cognitive problems that were different than food sensitivities <clears throat> because food sensitivities, they go away after a day, two days, whatever. These kind of like were just lingering for some time. And I noticed that there were some issues. So I was trying to take a lot of supplements that chelated heavy metals because I thought it was a heavy metal issue. You know how people say like fish, heavy metals. Yeah. That seemed to be the the, the number one thing. And then I realized that none of them made any difference. So I realized that I'm probably not having issues with the heavy metals in the fish. Mm. And so then I, I start to think, okay, what, what else does fish have that is problematic? And, you know, I, I realized, okay, they have things like plastics, dioxins, things from plastics because the oceans are contaminated with plastics now. And I would always eat like wild caught <clears throat> fish. And even if you don't, like there's other issues when you have farm, farm raised fish as well, right? It's okay. just, you know, w- one way or another, the, the, the fish has problems with, with toxins. In any case, um, but I would eat a lot of wild fish. And so I then thought like, what can detox against uh, plastics or dioxins or things like that? And, you know, and I said, okay, activated charcoal is something that could do that. And so I took five grams of activated charcoal, which is a nice dosage. Yes, a lot. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, normally people will take 500 milligrams. So they'll, they'll normally take like one tenth of that. Mm. But I, I, I like to really try things, and activated charcoal is quite safe. Uh, you know, and Historically, when people would take it, they would take a lot of it. They wouldn't just mm. take like a small amount. But So anyway, I took five grams. All of these symptoms went away in about like an hour. Like I just felt like this clearing up of cognitive symptoms, and, and, and I just realized that, okay, this, this has something to do with toxins that activated charcoal is bonding to, and it's probably the plastics. But I didn't know for sure, right? And then I discover through my genetics that I have a problem detoxing plastics. And again, these things are not that common. It's like maybe only 5%, 10% of the population had this kind of variation that I had. After that, I, I, I really was very hardcore about not drinking from plastic stuff. So if you'll notice, like if I'm drinking water, I have a container like this, not a plastic and so this is an example of something that, you know, I've had my genetics for the past seven years now, right? And <clears throat> I've only discovered this recently. Sure. So I, I, that's where genetics really comes in. Like you really discover things over time and it's just something you buy once and you have it forever and you keep learning new things. That's, that's the fascinating thing. You take a genetics test once, even if you don't get the whole genome you still get a lot of information. It's a hundred dollars. And then you just have that. You keep on getting tips over time. That's, that's way worth it for me. Joel, what's your, um, what's your advice with genetics? And because I, I've heard a, a couple of different things and the way that I approach genetics is, is that if I have some kind of condition or problem, or I feel something's not quite right with something, I'll delve into my genetics to try and get some insight And then if I get some insight, then I'll maybe try and qualify it by doing some experiments by maybe concentrating that particular substance, or maybe I'll have some blood work done. Some people seem to use genetics as the way to find the things that might be wrong with them. Is that is either approach right, or is one approach better than the other, or is one approach wrong? So they both have some merit to it, but you, but most of the, most of the time, the way you're doing it makes the most sense by far, right? So genetics is like a vast forest. And when you have an issue, it's kind of like localizing it to a certain part in the forest. You have some kind of locations, some, some coordinates to go to, to look for what is 
you know, what is my contributing factor here from the genetics, mm. right? And, and you kind of need that. The, the thing with genetics, you don't know if, if there's a lot of unknown factors, for example, if certain genes are expressing or not. You know, we also don't have perfect knowledge when it comes to genetics. So mm. we don't know the total risk caused by gene- like the genes and let's say this particular gene is causing the most risk or whatever. There, there's some, there's unknowns when it comes to genetics. And we also don't know always if they're causing it or maybe they're just associated. So we know that they're associated. That's <clears throat> usually what the uh, studies come back with. But it's very hard to uh, establish causation when it comes to something like genetics because it's something that you observe it, you observe it in the population but you don't know that if you change the gene necessarily that this is what will happen, right? Um, so what, what we do is we'll look at also, when we talk about genes in our reports or blog posts, we'll look at the mechanisms of how that pathway is working. And we want to make sure that it has something to do with the, the association so that it's likely causing the effect. Essentially, we're not at a point mm-hmm. where genetics can be used as something like a diagnostic. Mm-hmm. That we know okay, you have an 87% risk of getting X in this time period. We don't know that, right? And the reason we don't know that also is because of lifestyle factors. So they're really looking at a population and and really depends on the population. If you're looking at a population that is eating McDonald's all day, it's going to have a very different risk profile than if, if, if they're not eating McDonald's all day. What's your view on epigenetics? I think epigenetics is very important. There's no question. There's different ways to look at epigenetics. Some people, when they t- talk about epigenetics, they're talking about intergenerational effects, for example. There's been studies on mice and maybe in, in some observational studies on humans that when they've gone through hunger periods or let's say they went through the Holocaust or traumatic events, so there's intergenerational effects where you can have an event happening to your grandparent or great grandparent, and it can still affect you know you right. It can still it could it can have effects over many generations. That's one way that people describe epigenetics. But essentially, the the way that people are using the term is saying like lo- various lifestyle factors can influence genetic expression. What we're doing is we're looking at your genetic predispositions with self decode. We're saying here's what you're predisposed to. And here's things that you can do that will counter those genetic predispositions. Countering your, your negative genetic predispositions by changing gene expression in, in, through healthy diet and lifestyle. And I'm a very big proponent of that. I think that's one of the reasons why you can have, uh, why predictive power of genetics is a problem. Because if you have a study associated with some condition uh, the, the problem is, is that it maybe is only associated with that condition in the population that you studied. Maybe they had higher levels of toxins in their water, right? Mm-hmm. Or maybe they had higher levels of pollution, and it only comes into play when you have that pollution. Mm-hmm. And the other thing is that there's a lot of ethnic and sex differences. So if a study was done on uh, Asians, it might not apply to white people in the United States, partly because they have different diets, they have different lifestyles, they have different uh, environments that that could play a huge factor, but also because there's a lot of unknowns right now that it could be people often inherit a lot of genes together. You'll notice that, let's say, if you inherit something from a a parent, a mom or dad or whatever, um, you'll get like a cluster of traits together rather than just like one random trait here, one random trait there. Basically, ethnic groups have like genetic clusters that that are inherited together. And and same with, um, you know, families or individuals, right? You get these clusters from each parent. And and so we don't have enough information to know that it could be that if you have one gene, it only affects you if you have gene B as well. Mm. And so that's why you see there could be differences between ethnicities, uh, probably mostly because of the differences in um, environmental variables and diet and whatnot, but also because of uh, the, the genes being inherited together. Now, one thing that Nick mentioned before that I want to get to is um, what about the people who try to diagnose with genetics? 
And the answer is, is that I, in general, that's not a good approach. The approach that you take, Nick, I think is a good approach where you already have a problem and then you look at your genes and you, you try to get more insights into what you can do about it and, and, you know, and see like, uh, what is it, what is this related to what, what basically you're getting more insights into, um, something that you already know you have, right? You already have an issue. If you have rheumatoid arthritis and you have this gene that is associated with rheumatoid arthritis and, you know, and it, and it makes sense that it has a causal impact on rheumatoid arthritis, then that's probably having an impact on your condition and you want to know about that, right? You want to, you want to be aware of it at the very least. And, and uh, so when you're doing research or whatnot, you could see various um, recommendations that, have, that also might help with that pathway. The only time that it might be useful to use genes as a diagnostic is when you really have no idea what's going on, right? If you just have joint pain, rheumatoid arthritis, then it's pretty clear what's going on. If you have a diversity of symptoms, no diagnosis, doctors are not able to diagnose you, but you have a lot of symptoms, then you want to know what is this related to. So I'll give you an example of, of how that was. Um, I brought on a co-founder who, who is our, our chief science officer, and he was just browsing around my genes, uh, you know, just because that mine is the de- default file that we use internally, right? Mm-hmm. And he's just like, yeah, I just happened to be browsing. And he said, you know, I think a lot of your issues probably stem from the gut, um, like mm-hmm. the ones that you historically had yeah. that, that I was able to fix. He said, I think it had, to, you know, it, it, it stemmed from the gut. And I said, you know, that makes sense. Um, but what are you, why are you saying that? He said, because I looked at your genes and it's just, I, I, I just see a lot of genes that are like gut related, like that, that, that have to do with Crohn's and, other kinds of autoimmune issues. And what he says is that he, he thinks that I didn't get those diseases because of some other factors. But what happened is I got a lot of the negative effects from those genes. And so I kind of, I, I was basically in this pre-disease state. Mm-hmm. And he's, he's an MD, right? So he was conventionally trained. Um, he's not, I wouldn't say he's an, any kind of alternative guy, but he is open-minded, very skeptical, but open-minded as well. He's just looking at my genes and he said, look, you know, it's, it's clear that this is like, you probably have something like it probably started with the gut and then it made its way to other parts of the brain, the hypothalamus, things like that. But, it, but he thinks it started in the gut because of the number of genes that I had. And that makes sense because I've always had gut issues and then this, the other stuff came later. So in that sense, I never was diagnosed with, let's say, an official autoimmune disorder, but knowing that I had all the, a lot of variations that were related to gut inflammation, it started to make sense. Like you can, it's kind of like a, it's not, you can't really diagnose, but you could say maybe I'm in this pre disease state for Crohn's or ulcerative colitis, uh, things like that. And, and I would say that that's true. One of the things I found Joe was that, um, by using South Dakota found that I was, I had a pre predisposition to not processing vitamin B12 very well mm. and not recycling it. And I felt fine. You know, I didn't feel as though there was anything wrong with me. My energy levels were fine. But then when South Dakota said that um, through my methylation pathways, um, it's something that I don't handle very well. I then had blood work done. The blood work came back and proved actually that, well, the MD said I was in the normal range. Mm-hmm. So I was like 290 and the range was in the in UK is 200 to 900. Mm-hmm. Whereas the Mayo Clinic says optimally you want to be between five and six. When mm-hmm. I started um, then supplementing with hydroxyl B12, my surge in energy was incredible, but I knew no different. So I think sometimes for things like things that affect inflammation or energy levels, I think sometimes your genes can be quite a good indicator, but then you probably need to then back that up with some kind of blood work or a gut microbiome test or something else. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's perfect, actually, the way that you used it. That's how I recommend everyone use it. That's how I used it in part. I mean, I've used it in more than one way, but mm. I've used it in that way. I've, I've used it. And, and when we're talking about, let's say, my girlfriend, um, she also had a very interesting story. She actually used it twice. First, she used it, to fix her mood, 
She mm. realized that she had a mood issue. She looked at her mood report and she found that um, she she saw supplements, you know, certain pathways were, that were suboptimal and she took supplements that were recommended and her mood issues went away the next day, right? Mm. Which I think is is something that I, I found hard. To, like I saw firsthand, but it's something that I wouldn't believe if, if I heard it from someone else. Right. Yeah. It's very like, it was, it was hard for me to believe that, but I saw it like firsthand. So it, like she had mood issues for a year and, and lifelong really, but I knew her for a year at the time. And then all of a sudden from one night, from one day to the next, they just completely went away. And Ooh. so that was a massive difference. And then what happened, she was having other issues later on and uh, she took the similar approach here that you just did. She she looked at her genetics, and she found um, hey, she has this genetic predisposition for higher testosterone. And she looked at some of her symptoms. She read on self hack. She, she she read up that hey, if you have lower estradiol or like basically her 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 uh, ratio wasn't necessarily good, like high testosterone, low estradiol. She read symptoms of that, and then she also. Uh, she said, okay, let me take some blood tests. And she found the doctor said that they were normal, but mm-hmm. actually when she put them into lab test analyzer, they were not normal. They were, they were suboptimal. And so it's the same situation. They were genetics, took labs, did experiments, and felt a lot better. And, and the truth is, is that sometimes you'll do experiments. You know, if I'm playing devil's advocate, I'm not, I'm not going to say that it's going to be a hundred percent. Right. Mm-hmm. The, the, the thing is that you have to, it, it, it narrows it down more than otherwise. Right. Mm-hmm. And that's what you're trying to do. You're trying to narrow it down more, but essentially that's, you know, you, you might have some issue you say, okay, what could this be? You do some research, you do some preliminary reading, whatever and you say, okay, let me look at my genes, see if there's any genes associated with this, um, do more reading there. And then you say, okay, let me try to see if there's, uh, you know, anything in the blood that correlates, whether it's B12, it could be homocysteine, if it's MTHFR or anything. Uh, in her case, it was hormonal. Um, so you want to see if there's anything that you can check for in your blood. Sometimes not, right? Mm-hmm. And in which case, you'll skip that step and go straight to, uh, uh, you know, straight to doing some experiments. But a lot of times you do want to take, like most of the time you want to take some kind of blood test, make sure everything in your blood is normal or yeah. see what is suboptimal mm. and see if that can relate anyway to your genetics. But if not, um, e- in any case, either way, you have to then say, okay, based on the genetics, based on my symptoms, let me try this. And then if it, you know, in your case, it worked. In Eliana's case, my girlfriend, it worked. Given all the things that you've like researched and found and learned and, and your own personal journey to recover your health. What would you say are the three most impactful things that you've done? The most impactful for me were number one was the diet. Number two was getting outside more and being in like a sunny environment. Let's see, number three, I'd say for me, uh, supplements. What specifically worked? for you around your diet in terms of either bringing things in or taking things out? Grains and and dairy were the biggest things. And then later on, eggs were also a a significant thing. Dairy, I kind of like knew very early on Mm. just because like you eat dairy and then right after you, you, you know, you're all stuffed up and whatnot. And then beans also. Yeah. are, Are problematic. And then any starches really for me are also problematic. Yeah, but uh, the starches seem to be better than the grains. So when I when I cheat, I still won't consume anything with rice flour mm. or anything like that. I'll 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 look for um, tapioca starch or something like that. From your point of view, do you have any hacks that are your go to things that you do most days? I take a variety of supplements every day. Keep to my diet, and I, I still I, I don't keep it all the time. I probably break it a few times a week, but maybe twice a week. Um, but I know when to break it also. So for example, I break it on the weekend when, mm-hmm. when I exercise a lot. During the week, I don't exercise that much. But on the weekend, I play a lot of volleyball. I exercise a ton. And my body is already like drained. So my immune system is already lower. And it doesn't have as much juice, if you will, to react to these foods. Yeah, a lot of it has to do with like 
if you haven't exercised, if you haven't gotten sun, a lot of these healthy behaviors actually like reduce the immune system. They, they might increase it in some ways, but overall they're reducing the immune system. Um, like for example, sun is an immunosuppressant. If you get too much sun, you'll get sick the next day. If you get too much, let's say exercise, you'll get sick, right? Same with if you get too stressed out in general, uh, you could also get sick because all these things are reducing the immune system. Now, a little stress is fine. So is a bit of exercise. So is a bit of sun. If you get too much of any of these things, then it's problematic, right? Or if you have them together, cold is also an immunosuppressant. So if you, if you do too much cold, guaranteed you'll get sick, cold therapy, right? So if you're, if you're staying in like an ice bath for 30 minutes a day, guaranteed mm. you'll get sick. Why is that? Because it's an immunosuppressant. That's really um, interesting, Joe. And I think you may have given me some insight that I've been craving for quite some time because I've certainly noticed that for some particular food, since I've dialed in my diet, my sensitivities have gone up. Yeah. So I am i can't be certain, but I'm pretty sure that since I went on the Bulletproof diet and started going keto and cutting out all toxins from my diet, I'm pretty sure that, you know, okay, I haven't had a cold in four years. I haven't been sick in four years, which means that my immune system is doing its job from that point of view. But actually, I think my food sensitivities have probably gone up too. When I do too many things in a row, during the weekend sometimes, for example, I'll get exercise and I get mm. sun and then I'll mm. also do cold therapy because I'm, I'm by the beach. Mm. So the ocean is cold. The Pacific Ocean is very cold. So I'll get, I'll get cold therapy. I'll exercise for like four hours and then I'm getting sun also because I'm outside. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm getting a lot of these immunosuppressants in one, right? And I often start to like notice that, hey, like I'm a little run down, like I'm susceptible to getting sick and then I have to do things to boost my immune system mm -hmm. um, or just lay off, like have a recovery period. Something like sleep actually improves your immune system. It boosts the immune system. They all improve it in some ways, but Sleep is boosting the immune system. Vegetables boost the immune system. So actually, for example, if I have a vegetable juice with a grain, I will get a much bigger reaction than without the vegetable juice. Even though if I just have the vegetable juice alone, I won't have necessarily a very big reaction. Like, for example, cucumber juice. I can have cucumber juice and not really have a too significant of a reaction. But if I have the cucumber juice in combination with a grain, I will have a meltdown. Right. Mm. And, and, and also my reactions are stronger in the morning, for example, uh, because the immune system, like, first of all, you just slept and now your immune system, uh, like basically has recovered. That's another thing like biohacking and, and these kinds of things. It's really the, the experiments really, you could do a lot of different kinds of experiments and that's why knowing your genetics can have a big impact. Right. Um, and your labs as well. It really, cause if you just do an experiment, it could be, there's too many variables. That's the problem. And you really have to understand how the variables interconnect. Uh, so I, I really think, I'm a very big fan of, you know, doing these experiments and biohacking and everything in combination with your genetics and lab yeah. tests. I don't think people really appreciate how big self-hacked is. I think give the audience some kind of idea on the number of visitors that you get either per day or per week or per month. Yeah, so that can change based on the Google algorithms. <laughs> when it comes to health websites, 90% of the traffic is from Google. That's just a health fact stat that you can get online. It really started in like 2015. And so it was a relatively new site. We were growing quite fast. And uh, so at its peak, we were getting around uh, 2 million people a month, actually. Okay. And, and then the Google updates happened for the past year, and that really brought us down by quite a lot. So basically what Google decided is if your content isn't sanctioned by mainstream professionals, then Google will consider it fringe and they will not rank you. They considered uh, self-hack fringe even though it was very scientific. And so what we it's extremely scientific you know you yeah. can literally go through and see all the papers all the evidence so that's just quite frankly crazy and yeah, I, think, yeah. I think i feel quite angry about that because it's like there's two million people that are getting the information that they need that are just taken away from those individuals it just it just isn't right right i feel the same way 
But what we did was, um, in part, you know, bringing on this, uh, my, the, the chief science officer, and medical director, I, I thought that was necessary for a bunch of things because he has a lot of skills that are useful for self-decode and lab test analyzer. Uh, but in any case, when he came on, he looked at the content and he said, you know, this is really great content. But he understood that some of the things were not main, like they were not medical consensus stuff, right? Mm. And he also looked at, um, I think there is something to be said that when an MD, like when a conventionally trained MD, you know, who who really, like who was steeped in the conventional world, and then he became a scientist, he understands science really well, and he understands medicine really well, and how people think about it. And he understands like, in medicine, there's something called the standard of care. And when we're writing on self-hacked, we're assuming that you've already like done the standard of care or you've read about that on any number of sites. But what but his point of view is that that you cannot write something like you know if somebody doesn't understand your website, that you they cannot think that this is like a standard of care or something like so th- there's there's perceptions that um that that I don't necessarily appreciate that people might have. For example, let's say if we list potential benefits for a supplement or something. I see that as like, it's implicit that we're giving the evidence and you have to decide for yourself what it means for you, right? So if we're giving you animal studies, you have to decide, you know, uh, what kind of evidence is an animal study and that's up to you to decide. I never wanted to decide that for people because I always felt like for me, animal studies could be useful Whereas, you know, other people think that they're not valuable at all, right? So I always felt like I don't want to take a side in this debate. Let me, let me just, let's just say what it is, mm-hmm. what the evidence is, and people could decide on their own. If it's, they don't, if they don't think it's good enough evidence, they don't have to, you know, they, they, we're, we're citing everything. So, and we're, we're being descriptive. We always, we always mentioned, is this an animal study? Is this a human study? Um, you know, we try to mention how many people were in the study, things like that. So I never try to take a side in that. But the problem is that when it comes to Google, then Google is basically, it makes it seem like we're we're saying like these are proven, right? And being steeped in the mainstream space, he kind of understood where Google was coming from in that, um, you know, you want to give people a standard of care. You want to give for the, because there are people who really don't know. And it's like, you have to tell them, hey, this is only animal studies. So now what you're going to see in, in the content is like, this is animal studies. We don't know if this has any effect on humans, things like that. And I think it, like, it kind of adds a lot of content that doesn't need to be there. But the thing is, like, that's kind of what Google wants. He says like, our science is now better than every other site out there. By the new year, uh, by January 1st, the whole site will be updated. It's going to seem more conventional just because we have to put in like disclaimers and whatnot. Mm -hmm. We have to put in some skepticism because the truth is, is that I'm a skeptical person and I kind of, when I read stuff, I'm always skeptical that this, you know, I don't know if this really works. I got to try it out. Right. That's why I call the site self hack. You you, you try things out and see if it works, Mm -hmm. but there's people who don't realize that. Right. If you, if you talk about benefits, they think like, Oh, this is proven in humans. It's possible that that Google was trying to protect against that, like the people who, you know, just don't they, they, they don't know what's going on. You know, they're not necessarily an advanced user. I disagree with the with Google updates. There's no question about that. You know, if someone looks at like if they want to find natural cancer remedies, they shouldn't be like if they type into Google what are natural cancer remedies, they shouldn't find articles that only say. There's no such thing as natural cancer remedies. Even if, even if there were no such, such thing, people are looking, they want to find that information and Google is not allowing them to find it, right? And so there's different levels of this kind of update, but basically they're really silencing anything that's out of the medical consensus. Sometimes they're, the medical consensus is not correct and, um, and often people do want to know information that is not necessarily you know, proven or mainstream or things like that. That is what, you know, people, especially if you have, uh, like, let's say food sensitivities are not something that's cataloged in the mainstream very well, right? I I couldn't find any information on that when I was reading on it. And so the whole thing is going to be fringe. 
and Google would just ban the site if, let's say, we're talking about food sensitivities, even though it is, a, I think, a big issue in the world. I really don't like what Google did, but we have to play ball. In some ways, we did improve the site by ranking the evidence and you know, improving it for people who are not like necessarily sophisticated readers to know yeah. that, like, okay, this is an animal study. I know, obviously, that this is not 100% going to work on me. <laughs> I think, though, Joel, you know, in terms of the natural evolution of self-hat, it could be the thing that takes you from 2 million views a month to, you know, 5 million to 10 million because you may appeal more to the mainstream. Yeah, it, that, that's another factor as well, right? So um, the, what we're doing now is he's got the mainstream medical hat on and he's basically saying, like, if, if somebody printed this out and took it to their doctor had no knowledge of alternative or natural or anything. What are they going to say about this? And so he mm-hmm. says, like, based on the content that we have now, he says that it's going to be acceptable to the mainstream, and it's also going to be acceptable to people who want, you know, more alternative stuff. Like, mm-hmm. not necessarily that's not in mainstream medicine. So if it doesn't fix the Google penalties, which I think it will, but if it doesn't, then the whole Google thing is just a scam. So we'll, we'll, we'll yeah. see that because he said, I've looked at all these other sites. Self-hack now has the best content by far, right? Like it, it's, this is the most medically accurate content. All of our writers are scientists. They're not like, if you look at WebMD, Healthline, none of them have science writers. They, these, these people do not understand science and it's just fluff pieces. It's just regurgitating from other pieces online. It could be once you're penalized that you can't get back, in which case we'll have to transfer the stuff to a different domain. Basically, we, we're, we're thinking about combining it with self-decode so that it'll be on like content.selfdecode.com. There is synergies between the genetics and the other content. And so we, we think that under one brand, it could be more powerful than separating the brands to like self-hack, self-decode. Sure. Even if we do well, I think it's um, with Google, I, I think it makes more sense to have a central branding. Joe, we, we spoke about self-hacked and self-decode. Could you just tell the audience um, what a lab test analyzer is? Yeah, so that's actually something we're also planning on uh, putting on self-decode as well. It's, oh, okay. it's going to be, yeah, uh, we're, we're probably, we're, we're going to be um, converging all of our assets into like one brand and one domain. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's, it's going to be under self-decode. So essentially the idea is that we're giving you the information and tools to decode yourself. And Lab Test Analyzer was a project that we started on its own, but a lot of people have been wanting to use it in conjunction with the genetics, which makes sense. Lab Test Analyzer, it's a completely different software. It's analyzing the lab tests and telling you what's optimal, what's not, and how to get things in the optimal. We're also working on a version 2.0 that is going to take in together uh, the, all the symptoms, the lab tests, and genetics and uh, other data to come up with a comprehensive picture instead of like analyzing one thing one mm. at a time. Like, okay, here's your genetics, here's your labs. That's awesome. That's really, really great because I, I know that nobody's doing that currently. Nobody's doing it. That's correct. Yeah. So, Joel, I've got one last question for you. What would be your top three tips for any executive that's looking to increase their personal or professional performance? Number one is I really think that people should be looking at their lab tests and genetics. And, and the reason is because there, there is no such thing as one size fits all, right? If there was, imagine there was, then people would do something and then everybody would know about it and it would just work for everyone. Mm-hmm. It just doesn't happen, right? Um, you, you, what you see is that somebody's helped by one thing, another person doesn't really notice the same effects from it. And so everybody is affected differently. And mm. some people have, like, you're more sensitive to the nightshades. I'm more sensitive to grains. You know, we might both have food sensitivities, but if we're going out to eat and we're breaking it, you know, what are we going to pick when we, when we eat something? And, and that could have a very big impact. So it's very hard to give generic advice that will just apply to everyone. Like, what's your top tip? If, if my top tip worked for everyone, it would just, everyone would already know it. George, well, just thank you for your time. It's been a fascinating interview. I'm very, very grateful that you've taken the time to, uh, to speak to us at Upgraded Executive. Thank you. Yeah, my pleasure. Great speaking. Top man. Thanks, Joe. Cheers, Joe. 
I'd like to thank Joe for his time. Do check out Self Decode, Self Hacked and Lab Test Analyzer. Remember, if you would like to access our content one week before it's released, please leave your details at www.upgradedexecutive.com forward slash subscribe and we will send you a special link so you can access the videos one week before we officially release them. You can also follow us on all of our social channels at Connect With UE.